our keynote speaker is somebody that we've been working on for a little while and was able to secure him almost right after the last forum. And I couldn't be more pleased. I need my glasses for this. Uh, Dr. Ballard is a founder and president of the Ocean Exploration Trust. Director of the Center for Ocean Exploration, Professor of Oceanography at the University of Rhode Island uh, Graduate School of Oceanography. He had served in the U.S. Navy for more than 30 years and continues to work in the, off in the Office of Naval Research. He's a pioneer in development of deep sea submersibles and remotely operated vehicle systems. And he has taken part in nearly 140 deep sea expe expeditions. In 1985, he discovered the RMS Titanic and has succeeded in tracking down numerous of other significant shipwrecks, including the German battleship Bismarck, the lost fleet of the Guadalcanal, the US aircraft carrier Yorktown, and the John F. Kennedy's U-boat PT-109. He, he's also discovered the uh, hydrothermal vents and the black smokers in the Galapagos Rift and the East Pacific Rise in 1977 and 1979. He's offered, uh, authored numerous books, science papers and articles, and been featured on the National Geographic television programs, including Secrets of the Titanic, and more recent, the five-part miniseries, Alien Deep with Bob Ballard. Um, he also supervised, uh, or was a lead supervisor on Steven Spielberg's futuristic television Sequest series. He honors, his honors include 21 honorary doctorals, uh, National Geographic's highest award, the Hubbard Medal, and the National Endowment of the Hu Humanities Medal. He was elected as a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in, in 2014. And I need a nap now after reading that. Um, but please help me welcome our keynote for today, Dr. Robert Ballard. That video is going to be a hard act to follow, but I'll try. Uh, no, it's great to be here. You left out one critical piece of information, and that is, let me back up, is that I was born in Wichita, Kansas, where all oceanographers come from. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of room down here. I know the front pew is a little scary, but I can count tons of seats right here if any of you want to take a quick moment and get down here. But uh, come on down. Uh, Anyway, uh, I was born in Wichita, but I was born uh, six months after Pearl Harbor, so do the math. I'm 74, but rumors of my death are greatly exaggerated. Uh, in fact, I'm just hitting my stride, as you'll see in a minute. I was in Santa Barbara last night with the National Geographic Society planning our next five years of expeditions, and then I leave today to go back to Santa Barbara because I'm on the Board of Trustees at my alma mater, UC Santa Barbara, University of California, Santa Barbara. I grew up in, my father moved the family from Wichita when I was six months old, and I woke up in the Mojave Desert. Uh, he was a test pilot with Chuck Yeager, so you can see the genes I've been given. Uh, and he survived, although a lot of his colleagues tragically didn't. But after the war ended, he moved the family to San Diego. He started to work for uh, Convair and got into, ultimately got into missile technology and was, went on to become head of the Miniman missile. So he goes up that way. and. He, uh, he put me on the ocean, and I just kept walking. I am 13th generation, and we walked across the country, and I just keep walking. So uh, when I was growing up, naturally, my parents asked me what I wanted to do when I, was a, when I grew up, and I told them I wanted to be Captain Nemo, because I'd read 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, and I just thought that was the coolest thing. And I'm sure they went in the other room and went, Houston, we have a problem. But they, uh, they didn't. They didn't laugh. You should never, ever laugh at a child's passion, because the passion is the driving engine in life. If you don't love what you do, quit and find your passion. And so my passion was wanting to be Captain Nemo. So my parents sort of worked with me on it. They said, well, tell me a little bit more about Captain Nemo. Yeah, submarine, the Nautilus. And they said, that sounds like an oceanographer. Uh, because it had windows, didn't it? Yeah, it had windows and wheels and you drove around. So fortunately, right near my house was Scripps in the, uh, the largest oceanographic institution in the world. And, and so they took me there and ultimately I got a scholarship when I was uh, uh, in high school and went to sea on my first expedition and got rescued by the Coast Guard, which I thought was really cool. Okay. <laughs> in 1959, got hit by a rogue wave. Boy, that, I was a surfer and I went, that's a wave. But anyway. It literally ate us, and, but we popped up on the other side, fortunately. But also, right near my house was submarine base. 
So my, my parents took me down to the submarine base. Now this is right around, just after World War II, so we're talking DOS boat with the sausages hanging from the overhead. Uh, but I, and they, they got me to merge those two passions into one, because that's what the Nautilus was all about. And so I got my PhD in geology and geophysics and oceanography, uh, but then I served in the Navy. I'm still in, you never get out. I've been in naval intelligence for 40 some years, and we do have some challenges going on. Let me reassure you, we are addressing them. But if I told you, I'd have to kill all of you. But anyway, <laughs> uh, we are not asleep on the switch. Uh, so anyway, uh, shortly after arriving, naturally, uh, my parents always got National Geographic. And our house, in fact, the, the ceiling in the attic is sort of bull bowed like that because there's tons of National Geographic. So I think I have almost every issue. And when I was growing up, this was one of my heroes, Otis Barton and, and uh, William Beebe going down in the bathysphere. These guys were nuts. I wouldn't do that. I mean, I don't think that would be certified as a safe thing to use right now, because it, it was basically a wrecking ball hollowed out, and they lowered it down on a cable, and the pressure kept pushing the cable inside the submarine. So, and they, they had, uh, uh, see that, that's where you got in. And then they put this thing in there, and I got my Darth Vader laser pointer here, I think. Anyway, you put that there. And then they would pound on those nuts, those bolts. Pounding on it, the guys are inside. They're in a bell and they're pounding on these suckers for about an hour. I mean, it's a miracle. They, well, they do look a little, anyway. But then they had three windows, but they had no pressure housing, so they, they took a, a light and shined it out one window and then t looked at the other one through the other window. That was their technology at the time, shining a flashlight out of this window and looking at it out of that one. And that, another one of my heroes was naturally when they dove in Challenger Deep, 35,800 feet uh, in a Trieste. I went in its sister uh, bathyscaphe, I'll show you in a minute. But anyway, that, looking at BB's in publications in National Geographic, I mean, I must tell you, when I first looked at them, they terrified me. And then my parents said, no, they're only two inches long. <laughs> and I thought, just think, if that evolved into a hundred foot, I mean, no one would go in the ocean. I mean, can you imagine? <laughs> Lots of dentures. So anyway, when I first got in the Navy, here I am. Hello, lad, here we are, hello. Actually, I started as an Army Intelligence Officer in Vietnam, and that's not an oxymoron, be, be nice. But when I was getting my PhD in oceanography, they said, what the hell are you doing in the Army? And I said, only thing they had to offer. Uh, I went to UC Santa Barbara, and beautiful campus, right on the water where I'll be tonight, and they only had Army ROTC. So that's why I took it. So then anyway, then I laterally arabesqued when I was in graduate school into the Navy, and then I was assigned to this, this is a cool submarine. This is the Nautilus. Of the, of the world. I, how many of you ever heard of the NR1? Okay, must have a security clearance. But anyway, <laughs> this submarine is 150 feet long. It has the smallest nuclear reactor ever built. And what's really cool about it, you go under for a month. Now, you got to know everyone. You got to like everyone, let me tell you. There's 11 people in the submarine, and it has four racks. And you know the term hot bunking? It means the bunk never gets cold. Fortunately, you lose all sense of smell after the first couple of days. <laughs> Critical. And you get in there and you hot bunk. And then there's an observation chamber down because it actually has wheels, not real wheels, it has rollers. So you can roll along the bottom and it has windows and that is the coolest thing. The cuisine tater tots and TV dinners, I get violently ill if, if I see a, a, a tater tot or if I see, <laughs> I just, ah, uh, you know. So anyway, then I graduated to these guys and these are absolute death traps. These are called bathyscaphe. Uh, these are uh, the French one. This is my first uh, deep dive was in the bathyscaphe Archimede 
uh, in the mid-ocean ridge, which is, <laughs> this thing does not like rocks. But anyway, nor does this one. This is the tree S2, and I made my deepest dive, 20,000 foot dive in that one, and we crashed into the wall of the Cayman Trough, ripped open the flotation tanks, and all of this is avgas. And you know when you lose that, it's not good, because you don't come up. And uh, that was a day at the office I'll never forget, you know, trying to get back up while that's bleeding its avgas, de decelerating. And it was a matter of whether you were an optimist or a pessimist. And we barely made it to the surface, and, and, and they solved our problem. I spent most of my time in these guys, in, in modern submersible, particularly a one, a one we had at Woods Hole. I was at Woods Hole for 30 years, and this was my home away from home for a lot of time. And it, I took this picture, and it looks roomy, doesn't it? It's a miracle what a fisheye lens can do. Uh, the, I'm 6'2", and that's six feet. I used to have a lot of hair, lost it all right up here. <laughs> Ripped it, tore it right off my head. Now, when we make a dive, there's three people in the submarine, and it's, it's, it's fun. Uh, we do a little initiations. The, the pilots generally, submariner, has you know, been squeezed before and, and passed the, passed the uh, uh, claustrophobic uh, uh, test. And then someone like myself, mission commander, I've made hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dives, but I always bring a graduate student on their first dive. That's fun. <laughs> There's no bathroom in the submarine. So when you're on the dive cycle, and you tend to dive every other day when you're on the dive team, you do not drink any fluids and you just totally dehydrate your body while you're feeding coffee to your graduate student in great <laughs> I won't go into all of the things, but certainly they do discover that they, and we have a thing called a here bottle, here bottle, human element range extender. <laughs> it's, 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 women and men dive in both, so it has to, has a funnel, and, and, but it's designed to hold half a bladder. It's the cruelest thing in the world. So you got a plan. But anyway, I'll go past that one. Uh, leave that one alone. But anyway, another thing that really, that you can't see is when you get in this puppy, you are on the surface and that guy's been cooking all morning. And this electronics is just adding to the temperature. So you get in it, it's in the 90s when you get in. And add to that the humidity. You just, you know, it's humid air. It's like getting in a sauna. And you just start sweating profusely. And then they finally throw you in the water, and then they torture you while you go through your pre-dives. You know, if you're going to lose it, you're going to lose it during the pre-dives. And then finally, they let you flood your tanks, and you have these, well, you hold onto these weights, and then you free fall. And you go, uh, unfortunately, the, uh, your ascent descent rate has an exponential function in it, so you cannot, you cannot, you have to exponentially increase your weights to increase your, uh, linearly increase your descent. So you reach terminal velocity. And terminal velocity is about 150 feet a minute. So it's gonna, typical dive, the average depth of the ocean is 12,000 feet, and this guy goes past that. And so the, to get to the average depth of the ocean, it's a two and a half hour drive to work in the morning, two and a half hours to get home. <clears throat> so I'll get to that in a minute. So anyway, you're in this guy, sweating like a pig, and you're on your way down, you're relying upon the cold water to take the heat out of your subs, because you've got about two inches of titanium, and there's four, you know, water just on the other side, so that sucks the heat out. As it sucks the heat out, the temperature begins to plot, drop, and the, the moist air in the submarine uh, forms a sweat against the pressure hull, but inevitably right here where the hatch is, it, it begins to sweat. Now, you know it's gonna sweat and start dripping, and the pilot knows it's gonna, you don't tell the graduate student. You don't tell them that. In fact, you put the graduate student right under the hatch, <laughs> you turn the lights out, and you wait. And we generally take a bet on how many drips it's gonna take to crush this Moxo individual. <laughs> it's about eight drips. And when it starts dripping, it starts accelerating. But it doesn't drip, the first drip takes a while for the physics to manifest itself in the pressure hull. It takes about 45 minutes for the first drip to hit him on the head. And you're down a mile when that happens. And then you see him react, or feel him react, because it's totally dark, but you feel him react. And you know they're really losing it when they start searching with their flashlight. <laughs> they look up and they go, hatch, water, leak. You know, and 
And then they clear their voice, and it's funny, because it comes out something like this. I don't want to be an alarmist, is how sort of. <laughs> and, and they, I, but there's water coming in in the hatch, you know? And, and our response is, oh my God, we're going to die. <laughs> and, uh, and some of you know, it's fun, you know. Anyway, that's not why I really do it, although it's a nice Benny on the side. Uh, I'm an earth scientist, and I, oh, but, uh, and I really like getting to the bottom of the ocean. And the journey to the bottom of the ocean is most dangerous in the first 100 feet. First place, your pressure hull is, is just seated. It's, it's held in, and you rely upon pressure to seat it. So if you're going to have a problem with your portholes, it's going to be right at the surface, because you haven't seated them yet with pressure. So you're always looking for that. And, but during a deep dive, the pressure hull will actually come in. On a deep dive, you'll watch it flow in, because it's, it's, plexiglass is a super cool liquid, so it acts like a liquid. It, it does plastic stuff, and it comes in, and you go, God, I hope it stops. And then I hope it goes back, and it does, you know. And I remember when Beebe was in his, a classic comment in National Geographic was when he realized the pressure on his window, he said, I wiped it with a softer touch. <laughs> But that's nothing compared to these guys that are always hanging around, you know, because we're, you know, people throwing stuff over the board, and you're on station, you accumulate. So my cameramen have bad days sometimes. But uh, also, these guys, you know, they have these swords, and they use them. And we've been attacked several times by these guys. And this one made a fatal mistake, fatal as you can see, by going, he went for our window, but he hit the seam. And the seam hit, uh, so his sword went through the seam, hit the pressure hole, and bent it. So he was stuck. And, you know, it was, it was sort of couldn't complete the dive like that. So we brought him up and had him for lunch. <laughs> but once you get down, you really enter these amazing inner space. 95% of the world's volume is in international waters. 95% of the ocean's volume, the living space, the largest living space on Earth by far, is the ocean living space. And you get to the bottom, this is my favorite guy, this is called an octopod, I call him Dumbo, because he actually flies with his ears. It's really cool. These guys scare the crap out of you, they're vampire guys, and they go at your window when you don't see them. So, but then there's amazing creatures, uh, it's, it, it, you commonly get distracted as a geologist, but it's okay. And then you have to scrub them off when you pick up the rock. But anyway, but where I go is anything but flat. I like to remind people that the Grand Canyon is a ditch compared to the Cayman Wall. The Cayman Wall is 20,000 feet vertical wall. I went to the bottom of it, took a while. A 20,000 foot drop straight down from Cayman Island down to the Cayman Trough. And you can get inside of it. So it's anything but a floor, terrible term. But we, you know, when we, he's in Antharp first produced this, by the way, based upon seismic data, not bathymetry. This was this, they knew what the Germans did out here with the first echo sounder. They extrapolated it based upon the, uh, on the earthquake epicenters that are associated with the ridge axis. And here's the mid-ocean ridge. 23% of the worst, of the ocean's total, sur uh, total surface area. Quarter of our planet, quarter of the planet is this mountain range. And yet we did not go to the mid-ocean ridge until after the astronauts went to the moon and played golf up there. <laughs> NASA's budget to explore outer space is 1,000 times larger than NOAA's Ocean Exploration Program. They have better maps of Mars than the 50% of America that's in our easy. I hope that's having an impact. Anyway, not only is it a big place, but this was, as you know, where the Earth creates its outer skin. Because the Earth is a creature. The Earth is a living organism that can reproduce. And, and this is where it creates its skin. If you cut your body, a warm blood comes out in liquid form, it coagulates for through tissue. If you rip open the Earth, which is happening along the mid-ocean ridge where the plates are in, in, in convergence, it responds to that tear in its, in its body by bleeding its blood, a little hotter than ours, 12 to 1400 degrees centigrade, coming up from the base of the, uh, 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 coming up from the asthenosphere, and rises along that crack and creates new tissue. Now, since the Earth is neither expanding nor contracting, but is in steady state, everywhere we're creating, we're destroying. We have to recycle. So the ocean is constantly recycling, 
And if you look at this, which my favorite, age of the oce oceanic lithosphere in millions of years, the Earth as we know is 3.8 billion years old. And the oceans were here before the continents. The continents have been accreting through time, getting larger and larger as a process of subduction and, 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 and distilling lighter material to the top. As you know, the, the, the plates are floating on the a softer interior of the planet. And if you cut open the earth, it bleeds basalt, which is heavy. We call it mafic minerals, heavily in, uh, in iron and magnesium silicates. And then when it goes into the subduction, it distills it, and you get the lighter material that comes up, which we call sile, which is the uh, granite, for example, quartz, feldspars, which are rich in light metals, um, mag uh, uh, aluminum, potassium, sodium, and silicates. So the ocean uh, is down because it's heavy, and the continents are up because they're light. And every time they go at it, the ocean loses. It's pre-positioned to go under. It cannot eat. It's too buoyant. Now you can get some of it slivering up and forming what we call ophiolites, which are ore-bearing bodies within mountain ranges. But this is the collision zone, and this is the subduction of the oceanic plate. For that reason, it's the young. We can't find anything more than We're just in the final consumption of the Tethys, the great sea that existed, uh, went all the way from uh, Portugal all the way to, to uh, the Philippines was the great Tethys. And that's where the oil is on the continental margins of the ancient Tethys oceans. But you can see we're consuming that final uh, uh, oceanic crust in this collision between the African and Eurasian plate uh, where these were now in total collision here. Uh, the ocean's completely gone in the collision now with India and China and the creation of the Himalayas. But all along here is those collision zones. And that's where your oil zone is, too, because it's the ancient continental margin of the Tethys. And you'll notice that this, uh, the colors are, are different in width because the speeds of the plates. The plates are moving at different speeds. The plates that don't have continents on their back are moving much faster uh, than, the, than the plates in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the Atlantic. This is ground zero. All along this black line are tens of thousands of active volcanoes. Tens of thousands of active volcanoes, far by orders of magnitude more volcanoes under the ocean, but no one had ever been there. So we went down to take a peek. And we went first to the slow spreading system. This was Project Famous, where we went down in the, in the mid-Atlantic ridge. Now this is, should be totally black. I mean, it's a cold world of eternal darkness. So you don't see a lot of plant life because there's no photosynthesis possible in the deep sea. Most of the Earth cannot, surface does not have plants because most of the Earth is in eternal darkness and you cannot have photosynthesis. So that's what we were told when we first started diving. Don't expect a lot to, of life. Geologists don't like life. It covers everything they're interested in. We love forest fires. So we loved it, you know. And this is ground zero, so the rock is brand new. So. It, so we were exploring the, the spreading axis. This is the uh, North American plate and the Eurasian plate moving that way. Uh, this is about two and a half centimeters per year of separation. The volcanism is, is, is episodic. Uh, the, the motion is constant. Uh, when you get a plate going, it has too much momentum, so the plates don't stop and start. They're constantly moving and failing the system, so they're failing the brittle crust. And that failure then migrates down to the magma chamber. It's about a kilometer down and triggers an episodic period of volcanism, depending upon the rate at which the plates are spreading is how often that volcanism occurs. The volcanism in the mid-Atlantic ridge is point source, very typical of what we call pillow lavas, whereas in the, mid in the East Pacific rise, it's, it's not even a mountain range. It's moving so fast it's spread the topography out, and you get l l l l flows of lava that run for miles. And you just go, that, really? And I've been in these guys. And they go for miles. And so it's amazing, because they cap over themselves, and then they, sometimes the wall collapses in. So that was my first, really where I was initially focusing early in my career. And, and, uh, as, and, and I, we, I was chief scientist when we made a number of ex discoveries. And two of the ones I want to touch upon is, uh, prior to 1979, we couldn't explain the chemistry of the world's oceans. We didn't know why the ocean was salty. We knew it had certain mineral assemblage. 
But the problem was we thought the rivers were the culprit because we were taught the hydraulic cycle. You know, evaporate water, falls as rain, picks up stuff, goes back, and re-evaporates as pure H2O and leaves everything behind. We ran all over the world. I got a double degree in chemistry and geology, and, and we ran all over the world taking buckets of water of rivers, and the river chemistry was totally different than what the ocean had. So something was funny was going on. We didn't know what that funny thing was going on until we found one of these puppies. I remember driving along seeing, I call it a black smoker, which is absolutely stupid. It has nothing to do with smoke. Those are microcrystals of polymetallic sulfides of uh, pyrite, chalcopyrite, and anhydrite, and sphalerite, which is commercial grade ore bodies, copper, lead, silver, zinc, and gold. We are finding a vast, now imagine, let's, just, let's do the math. There are these black smokers, okay, where are they? They're all along this line. Stop right there. Those are the active ones. All of the colored crust had its origins there. We're on the map. 72% of the earth is covered in copper, lead, silver, zinc, and gold. And we're just dawning on us. You gotta be kidding. Yep, all of it created here. And it then moves and moves and everywhere you go, you get rid of the dirt. Well, here it's barren, so you don't have much dirt to get rid of. So huge interest now in mining. Companies are filing claims in international waters and, and with, or cutting deals with, with Papua New Guinea to mine shallower black smokers. Cyprus, the copper mines of Cyprus, the word copper, cuprus, drove the Bronze Age. 80% of all copper driving the Bronze Age came from Cyprus. It's a black smoker pushed up by the collision. It's a black smoker. All the mines in Oman are black smokers. All the mines up here are really old black smokers in, in the Canadian Shield. So they, but now imagine you've got, and that's commercial grade as it's coming out. That's commercial grade right there. So now the whole thing's going. But put that aside, when you look at how the circulation system, so look at all these cracks, about a kilometer of cracks for 70,000 kilometers. Add up the cracks, lots of cracks, and it goes down a, a kilometer when you calculate. The, the circulation going in to Earth, the entire volume of the world's oceans is going inside the planet and out every two to three million years. And when you plug that into the equations, all the equations balanced. Because what's happening is river stuff is going down and being uh, reduced and trading uh, uh, elements and then bringing up new stuff. And when you take that total circulation, it all balanced which was nice, a nice day at the office. But that was dwarfed by this, oh, that, particularly that guy. So, very nice, this is my friend here. So, fortunately, it's only that big, like BB, you know? But we saw these prof unbelievable profusional life living around these toxic hydrothermal beds. If you had a black smoker in your backyard, the EPA put a fence around it, call it a massive dump site. Carcinogenics, everything you can imagine. And most importantly, what's coming out of these vents is hydrogen sulfide. If you want to die an ugly death, take a snort of that or give it to anybody. It is bad, bad. Dying of hydrogen, uh, it's really ugly. And yet these guys are inhaling it. That's their lungs. And the biomass in the vent systems is eight times the carbon concentration than uh, life in the euphotic zone up in the sunlit moon. Eight times productivity. And they're not doing it through photosynthesis. They, they have this amazing, these guys, look at that, clams. They go to gigantic sites because who in the hell wants to eat one of those things? But uh, they have human-like blood in their body because they're in an anoxic environment. It's what's coming out is anoxic. So they have to store their oxygen and it puffing smoke's coming around. And if you, when I cut one of these open for the first time, it had no mouth, no gut, no digestive system. It had no internal organs. No internal organs. It had these guys what we now call extremophiles, organisms that can live under extremely hostile condition. Highly acidic, we've got them, you know, pH is one to 14, your body's supposed to be 7.4, if it's too acidic you get gout in your big right toe, and so you have to keep yourself alkaline. Well, this is highly acidic, and then you, we found Lost City where we found this uh, circulation much deeper into the asthenosphere where we were, uh, what we were doing was uh, 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 water coming in contact with peridotite and that, uh, that causes a, a reaction uh, in a pH environment of 11, and we're finding extremophiles. So we're finding extremophiles one to, from two to 11. So life is very, very 
grow busk, and that's how planets reproduce. This guy can survive meteorites. And who was our parent? We think probably Mars, when it got smacked 500 million years ago. That's why we're off to Europa, to the moons of the, of the sea of Europa, looking for extremophiles. Life is pervasive throughout the universe. Well, I don't know how smart their clams are, but they're out there. So anyway, but then I was doing the calculations and realizing I was spending all my time going to work. I spent all my time doing this, and I said, this, is, this stinks. So I went off to Stanford. I was teaching geophysics at Stanford in about 79, 80, and Silicon Valley took off. Microprocessing, digital imagery, fiber optics. I should have thought, you know, I can make a cell phone, but I didn't. Uh, damn, blown opportunity. I said, I see the opportunity to take all of this technology and create what I call telepresence. So I published this in National Geographic 1981. And I said, that's the future. Moving spirits, the heck with moving bodies. The human race, 95% of the human race lives on less than 5% of Earth. 95% of the human race, and we're going to double that again, but it's going to get very crowded. Okay. It's already crowded. The population of the planet has doubled in my lifetime. Scary. We can go off on that one and spoil your day. Read Jared Diamond's Collapse. It's a book that'll ruin your day. But anyway. Uh, so I said, you know, we, we, we've evolved ourselves into a box like a panda bear that can only eat a bamboo or a koala bear that can only eat eucalyptus totally non-nutritional eucalyptus leaves. We got to move our spirit. Our spirit is indestructible. It can move at the speed of light. How many of you saw Avatar? OK, remember Jake? In that, those, there's the Avatar was these Navis. They were nice, human-like looking people. I thought some of them looked sort of foxy. But, and they were big eight feet tall with funny ears and a tail. And, and they were really nice people that we were trying to steal their polymetallic sulfides. But anyway. Um, so Jake was moved into a Navi's body. So they had a Navi on a, remember the, that scene where they bring Jake in and the Navi is laying there and he na lays next to the Navi and bango, they made him a Navi. Remember the, he, a Navi's eyes woke up. What did Jake do when he realized he was in a Navi? What was his reaction? Do you remember what he did? He got up and ran out of the room. And they thought, oh my God, the guy's freaked out. And they ran and got Jake and said, are you okay? I'm fine. Why'd you run? And he said, I wanted the wind in my face again. Why? He was a war veteran, crippled and paralyzed from the waist down. He couldn't run. And when he woke up, he saw legs. They were blue, green, a little long, and he didn't care. He took off. That's my Navi. That is the first one I ever built, the Jason system, to carry my spirit. And I can beam myself down. Wait till you see what I'm doing now. It makes this look silly. So I, need, I, I designed this with my engineers, and then I needed to find some funding. And the academic world is always technology, uh, avo avoid technology. They'll, they'll, they'll take risks with their ideas, but they don't take risks with their technology. So I said, what do you think? And then I keep, well, going to keep with Alvin. I said, no, this will blow Alvin out of the water. It never comes up. Stay down forever. You know, it's miles per dollar, you know. I couldn't get them. So I went back into my intelligence world, and I said, what do you think? They said, love it. These are drones. You're removing people from the battlefield. Go get it. Will you fund it? Yeah. But we'd like you to do a few favors for us. You know, no good deed goes unpunished. But anyway. So I said, what do you want? And they said, well, we lost two submarines during the Cold War, Thresher and the Scorpion. In the case of the Scorpion, it has nuclear weapons, and we don't like leaving those around. And so we'd like you to go out there, but we don't want anyone to know you're going out there because the Soviets can put a satellite on you. So we need a cover story. And I said, have I got the perfect cover story for you? <laughs> the Threshers to the west of the Titanic and the Scorpions to the east. So they said, OK, we, you've got to do those jobs first. And then if, you're, if you have any time left over, we don't care. You go look for the Titanic. So uh, I had to have intelligence officers embedded in my team. So they said, you've got to pick three intelligence officers, embed them in your team, and have one on each watch, because we're going to do one where at the Scorpion, we're going to exclude certain people from the ride, friendship board. And so I picked three women. 
because they would, you know, the chauvinistic behavior back then, and still a lot of it now. I'm working on that in a minute. Watch me. I'm at war with that one. I had a, a female spook on each of the watches, and that was, that was cool. But anyway, so we went out and we did our job on the Scorpion. Tragically, it, 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 it telescoped inside itself. We found the sails, and then we found the, uh, the forward torpedo room, and then we wanted to get in that forward torpedo room where the nuclear weapons were. We did our, we didn't get, the, the first year was just find it. And so then I got that done. They said, OK, you've got 12 days left of a month-long expedition. You can go after Titanic. But I learned about the debris field. I don't have time to go through my, how I figured it out. But I, went, I used that oops, to find the debris field of the Titanic, walk in, pick it, bang. I, didn't, I did it visually, which people thought I was nuts in total dark. I said, I'm not looking for the Titanic. I'm looking for the debris field, and I can't see it in my sonar. I don't see you know, light stuff. So I'm going visual. And then, I can't, then they wanted me to go inside the Scorpion, so I then told the world I was going to go inside the Titanic. I was patting it. Cal, we're going to land at Cali. Anyway, but, so my job was to deflect everybody and say, well, we, we're going to go down to the Titanic, and we're going to land on the deck, and we're going to go inside, and we're going to explore. And then I went off on all the, all the Today Show, the Tonight Show, the Tomorrow Show, the Day After Tomorrow Show, uh, <laughs> while my team went back out to the Scorpion and went inside. So well, anyway, moving on, that's about all you're going to hear. Uh, I, <laughs> I did a whole bunch of other, I went on sort of a binge of Titan, Titanic Sister Britannic, the Lusitania, go after the Bismarck, and that was tougher than the Titanic. I did PT-109, National Geographic, you know, making them happy so they'd fund the stuff I care about, Guadalcanal. This was just sort of a binge I went on for, I don't know, about 10 years, uh, the Yorktown. Uh, but then I asked a silly question like a scientist, so what about the ancient mirror? You know, how, many, how many of them went down? About three million when you run the numbers over three millenniums. So I said, I can handle that. <laughs> so I said, where are you going? Well, naturally, I'm going to go where they are. But then I went against theory. The theory was that the ancient mariner followed the coastline. Dun, 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 dun. I said, that's bullshit. I mean, they, uh, these guys are businessmen selling wine to Rome. They're going to go straight to Rome. Boom. So I, I did my most sophisticated analysis. I drew a straight line between Carthage and Ostia, the port of Rome. And I said they went that way. Now, the beauty is sedimentation rate in the, in the Tyranian Sea is very low. So I said, let's get in the head of the mariner. He's got 3,000 bottles of wine aboard. What's he going to do? Drink it. What's he going to do with the evidence? Oops. Oops. What's he going to do with the empty bottles? chuck them. So I said, it's real simple, guys. Somewhere out here is an I-95 without an Adopt-a-Highway program for about three millenniums. <laughs> and it's going to be lined with Roman empties, because these are rocks. They're t terracotta, clay, it's a rock. And so I went, I, I, I started here and went to land to land. I knew I had to cross the highway, and I did. I, right in the middle was a highway four kilometers wide, which was how good they were in navigating. Thousands and thousands of empty Roman empties. And they, ran, they drank all the way to Rome. <laughs> and a little acceleration near the end. But anyway, uh, they were, oh my god, we haven't eaten our quota, or drank our quota. And so I just went looking for empt empties. And sure enough, I, I came across all the, and then I drove along them. And we found unbelievable. I found more ancient shipwrecks in the deep sea. But you'll notice they've been eaten. The wood's eaten by the tube worms, I mean, by the, by the uh, 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 what they're called uh, Cheritos, the wood borers. And we also would, would recover, but the ships themselves were the gone. But then I heard about the Black Sea, and that's where I went into the Black Sea. I went in there, and we also believe that's where the biblical flood took place, which is another discussion. But we went in there, and, and uh, the Black Sea has no oxygen below 100 meters. It's, it was flooded by the biblical flood, then it went anoxic. About seven, we actually dated it at 7,500 BPE because we saw when the fauna changed from freshwater fauna to saltwater fauna, it went like that. And then, but below it, when it went oxic, that's now poisonous. It's the largest reservoir of dissolved oxygen on the planet. So I saw that as an opportunity to find perfectly preserved ships, uh, which I did. And these are perfectly preserved. In fact, I just found a ship 500 BC with human remains and all their DNA. Spencer Wells, who spoke to you back, I was with him 
yesterday. He's a buddy of mine, and using the bones uh, uh, to get the, the true DNA of the ancient man and know who they really were. Okay, so uh, what are you doing for me lately? Uh, right now, I've been charged with mapping our country. Uh, the 50 percent that's under the under ocean, and particularly this area over here in Guam, because it's nothing but black smokers, and it's in our territorial water, so we own it. And this is massive amount of our bodies. We're also out mapping the uh, the uh, uh, to the east is an area cobalt rich crust in USC Easy Waters. It's full of uh, rare earths. China has a lock on rare earths, like 95 percent, and they're using it politically. And we have vast rare earths, but we haven't really map them. So this is my ship, the Nautilus. I uh, run it like the emergency room of a hospital because I don't know what we're going to find. So we go to sea. The next deployment will be for six months. We'll get up to an eight-month op tempo next the following year. And we go out. Here's how it works. We ask the community, gathering like this, if you had my ship and this, its toys in this neck of the woods, where would you go knowing you don't get to own the data? It's going to open source it. It's a community expedition. First time I asked people to come to the meeting, about four people showed up. In my sixth year now, the room is a giant room because they've got into the game. So the idea is this, is I have mostly young people on this ship. I'm going to keep the cost down. So I take, <laughs> so I, I keep the young people. Uh, so I got young people, teachers, I'll talk to you about that in a minute. Lots of students and teachers. And, and then I have a, a, a few old farts. Now to be an old fart, I'm an old fart. You have to not remember when you got tenure. <laughs> because then you don't have a dog in the fight anymore. The worst person to try to work with is a person trying to get tenure. They'll kill their mother to get to tenure. <laughs> They don't care about nobody. They are so self-focused, so I don't let them near my ship. You can talk to us on the satellite, but you're not going to get on that ship because you're totally selfish. Whereas an old fart is looking at his watch going, you know, I ain't going to, you know, I'm running out of time. Can we speed this up? So they have a huge motivation to move as fast as possible to find out before they run out of time. And so wisdom comes late and seldom time to use it. Now, we're, I think the aging generation is a great reservoir of wisdom. And they're generally cheap, too. <laughs> you know, I say, well, I won't let you go. Oh, no, I'll go for nothing. I just want to know. OK, well, that's good. <laughs> so the way it works is we go somewhere where no one has gone before on planet Earth, and we make a discovery. And it's generally Sunday morning at 2 o'clock. All, all my discovery, Titan, everything I've ever discovered seems Sunday morning at 2 o'clock. So we're down there, and we've come across some crazy thing. Well, this is all going up, up to the ship, and on the satellite, and down to my inner space center, and then out on the web, Internet 2, level 3. 10 gigabits of bandwidth. I can get you lots of HD if you're on Internet 2, level 3. And most universities are. So here's the game. I got the toys. I got my end effectors. There's my Navi. That's me. Carries my spirit. I'm putting 4K on it now. Uh, which is 16 times HD, and my lawyers have said, be careful. If they go into your command center and you show a shark, they might have a heart attack. Get them to sign a form. <laughs> so yeah, you're going to come in here. If it scares the crap out of you, just close your eyes and we'll lead you out. And anyway, so that's it. But then I go down, and so there's, I got an eye on this guy. This is my command center. You notice all the kids, and, and, and you'll see somewhere in here is an old fart. And then when we find stuff, we put it on the bird, and up it goes to my inner space center, then out on Internet 2, instantly. And then we got people all over the world that have these command centers. They're about 15,000 bucks, you know. The first one was more than that. But, you know, it's, it's the biggest one is the audio boards. The most difficult thing to network is conversations. Uh, videos are easy, but audios. We have an audio board, and, they're, they're, and unfortunately people don't buy a lot of them. So they're about 6,000 bucks. But they can, by the way you hit the switches, you can create multiple chat rooms in science, engineering, teaching, anything, all coming on the satellite. Uh, it's like the Tower of Babel, but divided into understandable units. And uh, it's cool. 
So we, we're going to be heading out, doing a whole bunch of stuff for National Geographic, going after the Ind Indianapolis to keep them happy. We're doing a lot of work in marine sanctuaries. Spent a lot of time in the Gulf of Mexico. Last, I've spent a tremendous amount of time in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, out of, all over the place. Uh, when we talk about that. Uh, multiple expeditions. But this is the one I'm after right now, which I'm really excited about. We just had a meeting yesterday, and they approved it, with the movement of humans out of Africa. Uh, through time, which we've gotten pretty, and that's what Spencer Wells done with, beautifully done with his DNA, and I'm sure you heard all about it. And there's a lot of, the one that I'm focusing on is the population of North America, uh, because we thought the Clovis, uh, spearheads of Clovis, New Mexico, which was 10,000 years ago, was when they first came in, when the glaciers melted enough in Montana, Wyoming, they could get by the, the ice barrier. But now we're finding all these older sites, like here's 15K, 13K, 17, and we believe they went by around, they walked the shoreline. So I got in the literature, and this is really funny. What's wonderful about Google is how you can really search stuff. So here is the post glacial, this is the last glacial maximum. This is the Wisconsin ice advance 20,000 uh, years ago. And you can see the sea level was down uh, about 130 to 140 meters, close to uh, four or 500 feet. And so I went into the literature and I said, has anyone walked that shoreline? Has anyone actually gone down to that shoreline and walked it? Zip. People have walked that shoreline. I said, no, no, look again. They do shallow water stuff, and then the oceanographers don't even have their equipment on at that depth. They're still turning things on. It's a, it's a dead zone of information. No one has ever walked the lax maximum. And I thought, and National Geographic likes this. I, know. I said, let's walk that shore. So I'm working starting a, I, Anacapa Island, because we think the Chumash Indians were the predecessors of the got around walking the shorelines. If you go out to Anacapa Island and, uh, and Santa Cruz, just these little guys out there off Santa Barbara, and they're away from rivers, so they're, they're, they're relic surfaces. On the land part of it, they got two, uh, 235 caves. Well, guess what? They got. So if you want to watch us, July 5th to July 28th, you can tune into nautiluslive.org and be a part of the expedition as we go cave hunting. And then we're going to develop the technology to go into the cave. So I've, 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 I've got all the spelunkers who are absolute nuts. And uh, I said, I, you know, I, and we're going deeper than you, but can I turn that into an AUV? So I'm working with uh, uh, several groups that have developed really sophisticated mapping systems. So you can go in and map them. And then you come back in and you do. I was asking Spencer, could I smell human remains? Uh, because there's a new program called eDNA. I don't know if you're familiar with it. You can go into a river and take a bucket of water and tell you all the fish species that are in the river and in relative relationships. It's really cool. You can find fish. I didn't know that fish was there. It's called eDNA. And they're, and they're doing it all over the place. It's taken off like a bat. So anyway, obviously we're after these people. This was done in a shallow water environment, but imagine that at the deeper uh, period of the 20, the when humans were on the move. Uh, because sea level was so low, humans were on the move. And no one has actually done that. So we're going to go do that. Education, critical. <laughs> critical. I think my most favorite. When I came back from finding the Titanic, there were 16,000 letters on my desk. I'd found hydrothermal vents, the origin of life, explained the chemistry, never got a letter from a kid. I find a rusty old boat as a cover for a military operation, <laughs> and I get zillions. And the, and the letters, all I still get them. I have a staff that does nothing but respond to children. Uh, so I, 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 re, I, read, I read a lot of them. They, they know all the answers now. Once in a while, they'll come with me. I, we have never had this question before. I was just doing one a few minutes ago, texting back an answer that had never been asked for. So anyway, the, uh, the kids always said the same thing. The letters were identical. Two sentences. What do I have to do to do what you do? Well, I went to college. I majored in, a double major in chemistry and geology, minored in math and physics, took the whole sign. Do that. <laughs> or is it price to play, kid. You can sit in the stands. Or you can practice your wind sprints. Now, when I played, when I was in college, where I'll be tomorrow, my alma mater, I'll be there tonight, actually, UC Santa. I played college basketball. Gene Bartow, great coach. And, uh, you know, when you had as many classes that I had, you know, practice, like, 
And he, I try to sneak, he said, no, 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 no. Do your wind sprints and shoot your free throws. Okay. A wind sprint is where you start at one basket and you put 180% of your energy in a full sprint and do it 30 times and then take the basketball and your, your body's shaking and I'll make your shot. And you did it. Why? Because you enjoyed wind sprints? I wanted to be in the game. I wanted to play. He said, don't do, you don't play. That's the price? That's the price. The kids, you want to play? That's the price. That's your mental wind sprints. If you don't do your mental wind sprints, sit and watch in the stands with everyone else. The second sentence was, next time you go, can I go with you? Absolutely, I can move your spirits. But another important part of the game is, so we do unbelievable amount of television production Raptor. I have an entire, I married it. My wife, I met at National Geographic, television producer, so I married television production. My daughter is now fully, she got that gene. She sailed on the Nautilus since she's been 15. She's now uh, in, a freshman in college and she's a, a pro video engineer. Uh, she's mastered it, and you'll see her I'll point around in a second. So anyway, we do unbelievable amount of productions. And we go into schools, we go into boys and girls. We just, 24 hours a day, it's just dark down there. And so don't tell me about time zones. And we work 24-7, so we're constantly in the, in the game. We have museums, we have uh, in Houston and, and Dallas. We, we have, we're broadcasting live interactive shows. We have amazing following, it's outrageous on social media. But here's the most important point. Here's the most important point. Lewis and Clark call their core of discovery, they call them the core of discovery. I call my team aboard the Nautilus the core of exploration. But unlike Lewis and Clark, I mandated that 50 5% of the core will be women in positions of leadership and authority. I'm the only guy in the top management of my team, and they're spreading banana peels everywhere. In addition to, in addition to mandating women, which we have reasonable percentage here, we also need to work on the faces. A child needs to see their face in the core. If they don't see their face in the core, the message is sent, you can't play. So I've mandated we will have the faces of America in those proportions in the core. So that a child sees their face. And I actually want to rename the country, not the United States of America, the United Shades of America. Okay. And we take them out and we train them. We can see them really uh, uh, learning at the hands of experts. They're embedded in the team. And then we put them in the hot spot. And there's my daughter, Emily Rose with a button nose. And she only tunes in when it's an all-female watch. <laughs> yeah, I love it. You know, so say, well, maybe if I'm on watch, she might check in. But now she's out more than I am. She's spending more time at sea every summer than I am. I'm sort of jealous because I, I built all this. Stuff. But anyway, it's just amazing. I have them wear uniforms because uniforms empower. I've been in uniform all my life, from Cub Scouts to Boy Scouts to Explorer Scouts to the Army to the Navy. Uh, the uniform empowers. I picked blue and gold because the University of California, but don't tell anybody. Uh, and, and I just love it to get them out there and go where no one has gone before on planet Earth. Thank you very much. So you want to, all right. They're telling me we have a, a, a few moments. So why don't we turn up the house lights and surface? I like working in the dark, but let's get back to the surface. I love the sun. And, uh, Fire away. If I can answer the questions without violating national security, I will. <laughs> yes? Since we're the 
Hadez, Rupert Murdoch uh, purchased the national, yes he did, but he put his son James in charge in Lachlan. And uh, James was my neighbor. I live in Connecticut down the road. And, he was, and he's, a, he's an anthropologist. He just got stuck with running this small little company. Uh, so he does get it. And, and, and if you start watching, you'll start seeing the programming going through a dramatic change. So a huge five-part series on Einstein. Uh, there's a huge impact upon programming. And we had a, I was just three days on that. Uh, I flew in last night from all of that. And, you know, they've done all my expeditions and uh, give you a sense. Titanic is still number one in history cable television. And so I've aired a lot of my shows on that, and it's just a question. They now, what they did is they downsized the geographic from 1,000 a, a people to 300. But they now have a, over a billion dollar endowment. And they get 20% of all of the net proceeds from television, magazine, all those products. So they are now a, like a National Science Foundation, but focused on, on the oceans and, and conservation. A uh, huge program called Pristine Seas with uh, Eric Salas, who's now worked, they've worked to, to put one million square miles in, in conservancy around the world, unbelievable amount of work. He gave a presentation, a standing ovation, on the amount of work National Geographic's done to create, create um, marine sanctuaries and reserves. Uh, so no, yeah, I'm still there. And if I felt they were threatening the brand, I'd be out of there in a heartbeat. But I've been there longer than anyone. I've been there uh, 43 years. And like I said, I married it. <laughs> yes? A abs actually, it wasn't that. The, uh, uh, the question was that, 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 that these are highly acidic, uh, the black smokers. That, they are not the problem, it's the, the extreme alkaline environments. But it turns out that uh, uh, when we went in the Black Sea and to the pure, almost pure H, I mean really much higher H, uh, H2 uh, 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 hydrogen sulfide, H, uh, uh, the vehicles came up cleaner. In fact, I would dunk old cars in there and they come up all, <laughs> no, they came up spotlessly clean because it's highly reduced. Uh, so no, I would, uh, I, 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 we, we, we worry more about the temperature. I mean, when we first came in on a black smoker and I told the pilot, I want to know how hot it is. And he went, really? <laughs> I said, I, I got the, I got, I got, I, yeah, I got to measure it. Well, I had a little thermometer in the front of the submarine's basket, and I pick it up with a manipulator. The problem with a black smoker is it's blasting out, so you get a Venturi effect. And so as you approach it, it starts to pull you in, and he didn't like that at all. So he's had to throttling back. So he's throttling back, trying to dynamically hold the submarine. We're 40 feet off the deck on the top of those guys. And I stick the thermometer in there, and I had it, and it went poof. And he made this great scientific observation. That's hot. <laughs> And when we pulled out the probe, the entire probe had melted. And he said, Bob, the window made out of the same stuff. <laughs> but fortunately, because of the Venturi effect, it, the, unless you just don't get above them. But what we didn't know when we found our first black smoker, what we did, that you saw there a pipe organ. There are pipes. We were sitting on another one. It was burning us. And it was that far from our down-looking porthole. And we came up after that first dive on a black smoker and went, oh my god. The whole syntactic thing was burned. And that could have been a real bad. It would have been an instant. You wouldn't never know what hit you. It's instantaneous. But we then put temperature sensors all around it so we now know when we, we can feel it. So, but yeah, it's more the temperature of those guys because you get such free circulation and the acidity dilutes rapidly. In fact, when you look at a black smoker, if you're foolish enough to get really close, uh, it's clear fluid. So when it first comes out, it's a clear fluid, and then it quenches. Uh, the temperature about 650 degrees Fahrenheit, so 350 uh, degrees centigrade. It will quench to four degrees like that. And it's that quenching process that causes this microcrystals. The, the smoke is, mic is microcrystals of pyrite uh, and hydrite. Uh, sphalerite and, uh, and so, and uh, calcopyrite. 
And those are the polymetallic sulfide assemblages, and that's being made in front of you. And as a geologist, it's always interesting to pick up a rock that's younger than you. <laughs> Are you concerned about the environmental impact of potentially mining? The Big debate. I'm on a Pew State. We had, you want to see a battle going on? It's going on right now. Uh, I keep arguing don't go after active ones. But let's, give, let's put things in perspective. You know, geologists are terrible environmentalists. We've seen Tyrannosaurus Rex come and go. You know, so we're somewhat, uh, unfortunately, almost conditioned to be a little less sensitive than biologists. I look at the Earth as an organism, so I'm looking at a scale of billions of years, hundreds of millions of years. But anyway, uh, so I took a group. So I, you know, I take VIPs out with me and charge them a little money. And they said, we want to go to the Galapagos Islands. We want to go back to where you found the first hydrothermal vents. You got it. Jump on board. And that was last June. Or, uh, no, the previous last June. And so we went to the Galapagos Rift, went out there, and we went down, and, and they were all gone. Oh, I, I was panicking. There was, there was blah, blah. I went, crap. So then, where's the 79? Gone. Where's the 2004? Gone. All the vents that we knew about in the Galapagos were gone. They'd completely been overrun with lava. These vents live where they're going to die. And it's very ephemeral, and it happens. these vents do not stay on very long. Because once they've tapped the magma chamber of its heat, it turns off. In fact, when you look at a vent ecology, you have generally one class of clams, one year class. Because they get in that crack and, and siphon, and they tell the kids, good luck. And they put out the larvae, and the larvae takes off with a huge mortality. But they do not settle where the mom and dad are, because mom and dad are throwing them out of the nest says, I ain't giving up this guy. And if you date them, they're, the dead ones are seven to nine years. So you're looking at a particularly faster spread. Here's a real turnover. So you're going to say, are you going to save that clam by mining the, the black smoker next to it? So you say, well, let's just give up on it because it's an emotional argument. It's not a logical argument. So let's, uh, let's accept defeat that they really care about that clam that we, that's in total darkness that's going to die in a, about a week. So give up on that. Go look for dead ones. Go look for dead vents where there's no bios. They're all dead already. And so, because remember, the black smoker is putting it all up in the, in the water column. Most of it is, goes up in the water column of what, what you see in a black smoker. Only a little bit actually precipitates and forms the deposit you saw. Mining would simply put that back. I mean, you're, you're, the mining would replicate. It's not the problem there that they're focusing on. It's the problem up there. It's the problem up there is when you bring that all up and do you then begin processing it, where you're not going to dump that in the euphotic zone. That's another ball game. So get off focusing on what you're going to do to a tube worm. Focus on what you're going to do the, to the euphotic zone and dumping all that stuff. So then it becomes a process, question of how you're processing the ore. And that's where you want to really focus your attention. I mean, because that's where you would put it in, a, in, a, in an environment where you do lots of damage. So yeah, that's where the arguments are really need to focus in it. It's getting people to focus on the science of it because there's, there's a good way of doing things and a bad way of doing things. But the big problem is Russia has just filed for permits in the high seas. You know, uh, China is not the greatest environmentalist, you know, and you start looking at the countries that are now going into the high seas to mine, that's where it's going to happen. It's not going to happen in someone's EEZ because, because there will be those battles. It's going to happen in the high seas. And they're now issued lease blocks to these guys in the Clariton Clipperton fracture zone. And yeah. I'm, I'm concerned about that. And so we're trying to get in there to, to type, to get the ground truth. No one's ever done this. You know, it's really funny. Uh, we're having the same thing with marine sanctuaries. Uh, we're making sanctuaries not knowing what's in them. We just made a gigantic monument in the Northeast. And we're making a sanctuary. And then they asked me to go in and find out what's in it. And this congressman, I took a congressman out with me. 
who controls CJS, Congressman Culberson from Houston. I took him out, we were out in the marine sanctuaries off of the Fairlawns and the uh, Channel Islands in Monterey. And this, we were making, we have on the bottom of our ship a wicked awesome multi-beam mapping sonar. Uh, it's built by, uh, the original one was by Harris, the Harris Array. I don't know if there are any relationship with the original, uh, but these were super classified sonar systems during the Cold War on the bottom of Liberty ships. And it finally leaked uh, into the real world. And now you can buy one from, from Kongsberg. It's an EM-302. Nine tons, three million bucks on the bottom of your hull. And it has massive detection capability. Not only can it make you a beautiful bathymetric map, it can see uh, uh, gas and bubbles in the water call at full speed. And we were off of Oregon, Washington coast, or better yet, I grew up in LA, and one of my favorite shows was Sea Hunt with Lloyd Bridges, shot on a Chris Craft off of Palos Verdes. So I had to go back there now. So. so I'm off Palos Verdes last summer, and I'm seeing cars on the, on the road, and I find a massive methane seeps. In fact, during our last deployment, we found 500 large methane seeps from all across Oregon, Washington, California. 500 coming out of the continental margin. And how do you not know that? And none of that is in global models. There is so much methane I cannot, because our, simply because we can detect it now. We have a sonar that's running along, we go whoops, and we see it in the water column. In fact, a particular oil company, I cannot mention their name, asked us to go into their uh, lease block in the Gulf of Mexico ahead of them. They said, we want to go in there. We, we, don't want, we want you in there first. We want you to map it, and we want you to map the salt domes, and we want you to tell us which ones are leaking and which salt domes are not. Because when you do geophysical work, you can see the structure, you know, stratigraphic traps, particularly around salt domes as they tip it up and get a cap rock and it accumulate. They don't know, you don't know, you know, how much is in there, just betting when they hand that envelope in. And they said, we want to know which ones are tightened, buttoned up, because they're going to have the largest reservoirs. And when you see the leaking ones, type them, do the chemistry of them, because every seep has a signature. They want to know if it's their oil or not their oil. Because there's, you wouldn't believe how much oil is pouring out of the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico. It's staggering how much is coming out naturally. It's, it's amazing. I, I could go on with image after image pouring out of the bottom of the ocean. Surrounded by billions of mussels. All those seeps are surrounded by billions and billions of mussels. Osmoregulating, chemo, chemo they have chemosynthetic capabilities of the methane, and there's billions of them. So we went out to the BP oil spill with a team called EcoGig from a lot of universities to look at the impact of the spill on the deep sea corals. And, and we, now I think they're in their seventh year going back to the same corals, which we did. But it's the dispersants. That's the killer. The dispersants are kill, the killers. To get it to go away from the nightly news to make it go away, put it on, and get it to go, and it goes down to the bottom. And these are very harsh chemicals. You should never use dispersants, because you're just killing everything down there with those har harsh ones. So, so yeah, it's an interesting learning curve, and uh, there's so much we don't know. But I know that when we were in the sanctuaries with the congressmen, and they were all excited about the maps I was making, and I was taking them to the, and they said, wow, this is cool, and the congressman, so you, you don't, you, you don't have a map of the sanctuary? You've never been in the sanctuary till now? Uh, is it the system backwards? And he's, he made this comment, didn't Lewis and Clark go ahead of Yellowstone Park? <laughs> <laughs> so this is where you can need to be careful of getting you know, a little too goofy. And then what we found, which we demonstrated, they, they were studying deep sea corals. And deep sea corals are critical because they are sort of the, 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 the environment in which little guys can hide. They're the sort of the miniature forests of the deep and the deep sea corals. And so I've done enough work where I tend to know where they are. They tend to like to eat. And they tend to like to be up where there's a real good flow 
a base of a scarp, typically get a nice upwelling where they're getting lots of nutrients. And so I'm down there and, I, and I'm looking at the map and I says, you know, I'll bet you the corals are over here. They, well, that's not in the sanctuary. I said, but, but we're not finding any in the sanctuary. I mean, I think they're over here. And so we went over and we went about a kilometer outside because I looked at the topography. I said, they're, they're, they're going to be there. And there was massive amounts of these. I think you really trade some of what you has nothing and maybe move the boundary. So the, you really need to do the exploration phase. And we're not doing the exploration phase. And so the total budget for NOAA's ocean exploration program when it was created in 2004 was $4 million. That's about the price of a toilet seat on a, on a space shuttle. Uh, it's now up to $36 million to explore a size that equal the United States. It's going to take a while. All righty, thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Dr. Ballard.